good afternoon and good evening, depending on where you are joining us from around the world. And welcome to the first aid training offered by the Egyptians Together Union in collaboration with uh, Dr. Sherat Mohammed, Dr. Magid Al Maligi, Dr. Ahmed Abdul Hadi, Dr. Mohammed Ibaid, and Dr. Luca Solano. We just want to remind everyone that you will have chances to ask your questions, so please do post your questions in the chat. During the session, uh, if at any point in time uh, you have any inquiries, please do post them in the chat as well. The technical team will be able to support you. We want to remind you, as you can see here, this is the promotion for the session which you have joined us with. And this is the first session of a sequence of five sessions. Uh, each session is approximately uh, an hour long with opportunities for uh, open discussions, questions and answers at the end. And today we are joined kindly by Dr. Jam Luka, who will talk to us about uh, a few topics, um, which he will talk us through in a moment. We would like to remind you that certificates uh, are provided for the training for those who complete all sessions of the training. However, the certificates will only be posted for members of the Egyptians Together Union. If you haven't registered yet, please do take an opportunity uh, now to go over to our website and register. The membership is on egyptianstogether.com uh, slash become a member, and it is free until the 31st of December 2021. But with that being said, and without further ado, that's a warm welcome from the Egyptians Together Union to all of our guests today. And we'd like to hand over to our uh, honorary guest, Dr. Jam Luca Solano, to talk to us today about the first session of First Aid. Over to you, Dr. Luca. Uh, well, let's see. I'm just going to start sharing now my screen. Very right, good. So it is, it is really, really, really. Uh, a pleasure to be with everyone today. Hopefully today's session is going to be a bit interactive, so I hope that throughout the sessions you're writing down your questions, you're thinking about uh, those moments in life where you thought, hmm, I could have known something about this and I could have done this or that. And so I want everyone to pretty much start writing all those memories of events that you probably had at some point in your life and you were a bit frightened about it but hopefully today um when we speak about this four big buzzwords that you see in front of you of your screen it which that can be frightening sometimes but hopefully by the end of this session you'll feel that although there are very complex conditions the things that we can do on a day-to-day -day basis if someone is struggling someone's having a hard time with any of these and the most common complications that they, they might have with these conditions. Um, and that way, if you're around and someone's struggling, then hopefully you should be able to give them a hand or at least know what to do in a time of crisis. Uh, and I think that's very important because most of the times we don't know what to do, we want to help, but sometimes knowing the basic steps or like basic things um, can really help us understand um, how something can be done for someone that's going through a crisis, especially in this uh, big four buzzwords. So, uh, so let's get started. All right. So, uh, like like they said, my name is John Luca. I'm, I'm a doctor working in software royal, and hopefully today I should be able to teach you some good stuff about this uh, full conditions that hopefully will be um, useful for you on a day to day basis. So we're going to start with the first big buzzword and I know it, it sometimes can be frightening when you hear the word diabetes um, and to some people it might be a, it might be a very common term especially because you might have a relative who has, who has diabetes or you might have a friend who has diabetes and most of the times we think about diabetes and we think about very sinister things like issues with their eyes issues with their kidneys or issues with their limbs and stuff like that but that's, there are things that don't necessarily need to be that dramatic, to be very dangerous for people's uh, health, people's life in general. So today, we're just going to have a, a very basic concept of what diabetes is. So to start off, on the left side of your screen, you're going to see what I call a blood sugar um, monitor level, basically, or level monitoring. And you can see that there's three levels to it. There is a very low, there is a normal, and there is a high. Now, there is a key message I want you to take home today, and that is that usually, usually, 
when we think about diabetes, we should always be scared of low glucose or low sugar. Don't be too worried about high. And when I mean don't be too worried about high, I mean you can have high glucose or high blood sugar, and that gives you time to go to a hospital or go to, or get help. Whereas if you have low sugar or low glucose, that could be life-threatening. So it's something that you should always bear in mind in terms of if someone you know has diabetes and they might go into low sugar, or low glucose, that could be life-threatening. So things that you need to think about when you have a patient, well, you have a friend or a colleague or someone at work or someone at home that could be experiencing this type of complications, low sugar, it's the thing that needs to bust in your head and go, okay, low sugar, danger, I need to get help for this. But in general terms, what is the big thing that most patients with diabetes um, are concerned about? Now, they're usually trying to find a balance between their sugar levels and the insulin they use. Now, bear in mind that not everyone uses insulin. Some people might not use insulin and they just might use some oral tablets or some sort of injection that are not necessarily insulin. Most of the times, insulin is gonna be related to type one diabetes, very young patients. But not all the time, obviously. There are some exceptions to the rule. You might have some elderly patients who might be on insulin too. Now, basically, what they try to do, uh, the patients who have insulin uh, as part of their treatment options, is they try to find a balance between their intake or their sugar levels and the insulin they're taking. Basically, some patients might have a fixed amount of injected insulin. That means they have a fixed dose, but some people might actually have a different dose according to how much food they eat, depending on the carbs, depending on the fat, depending on everything, really. And these patients, they usually know because they are trained to do so, they usually know how much insulin they're going to need, depending on the levels of sugar. So insulin, in a nutshell, it burns up sugar. So the main function of insulin is to burn up sugar or glucose. And the sugar, obviously, the things we eat. And if we eat and we take insulin, that becomes a very well-balanced, uh, very well-balanced uh, interaction between the insulin and the sugar. Okay, now this is in, a, in an ideal world, okay? But sometimes what can happen? Sometimes we might eat more and we might take less amount of insulin that needed. In those cases, what usually happens is like our glucose or sugar levels are going to go up. So think about it. We're trying to find a balance. So if we do more of something, that means that, that, that that's going to go on one side more than the other. So the, the amount of sugar that we take and the amount of insulin that we take needs to be well balanced to keep a level of sugar appropriate. Now, in this case, what happens is that you, as you can see, the sugar is very low. Uh, sorry, the sugar is very high. So because of the big concentrations of sugar and you have very small concentration of insulin, so you got that balance leaning to the sugar side rather than being in a perfect balance. So in that case, what you get is a very high blood sugar levels, okay? So keeping that in mind, what would happen if it's the other way around? What if we give too much insulin and we take very little sugar or we eat just not enough. Now you might think, but how can I tell that someone hasn't, hasn't taken enough sugar, enough you know, glucose, enough nutrients? So it's very simple. Sometimes some people might have a fixed dose of insulin and let's say they skip the meal because sometimes life can be very hectic. Let's say if you're at work or maybe you're going to uni, you're commuting every day and all of a sudden, you forgot to have your lunch, you, have, you forgot to have your dinner or your, your, your afternoon snack, but you took your insulin as 
was prescribed by a doctor. So basically what happens is that we kind of overdose on insulin. I know overdose sounds a bit dramatic, but it's really what happens because we have too much insulin in the body and not that much sugar to interact with. So all that together can cause low sugar or low glucose. Now, this is when we need to think danger, okay? Low glucose can be very, very dangerous. And the reason why low glucose is very dangerous, it's because one of the main, one of the main things is because the brain cells can only use glucose for energy. So because the brain cells are glucose or sugar dependent, if we take that away, those cells in the brain are going to go, uh oh, this is not good. I need to get some glucose. Now, the body itself has different mechanisms to try to compensate this. But if we have more insulin because the patient is on insulin, then that's going to cause, even if we have those backup mechanisms, it's not going to be enough to try to get that glucose up. So you might go into what we call hypoglycemia or low glucose or low sugar, okay? Now, remember, oxygen plus food equals energy, this equals life, okay? So it's a very simple uh, mathematical um, formula. When you've got your oxygen, you're breathing fine, you're eating okay, you get energy, you get life. But if you're missing one of these, there might be an issue, okay? Now, now you must be wondering, okay, so now I know that if I have a friend that has diabetes and they're on insulin, and let's say, uh, I think they might be going into low sugar. How could I know that someone's going to low sugar, okay? Now, there's a few things you can think of to, to, to make you aware that someone's going to a low glucose level or a low sugar level or hypoglycemia, as we, tell, as we usually call it in the hospital. Now, you might see this quite a lot, but some people might start being a bit sweaty and they're like, like, it's very hard, but the weather is fine. It's not, you know, it's not really hard. It's actually very cold, but they're getting very sweaty, very clammy, and they're starting to speak a bit slurish. So they're kind of like, rah, rah, rah. so they can't really speak properly. Or they tell you, I'm feeling a bit lightheaded. Okay, or they might go very pale. Okay, or, or it might get to the point where they might actually faint. So at this point, let's say you have a friend at home, or you have a friend at work, you have a friend at uni, and you know there are they're, they're diabetic and they're on insulin, and all of a sudden you know your friend and you, you look at them and they just don't seem right. They look very pale, they look very sweaty, and they feel lightheaded, and they tell you. I don't feel well. So the third thing that needs to come to your head is like, I think my friend is going into low sugar. I need to give him a hand. So you might be wondering now, okay, now I know what it is. I know how to, how to identify it. What am I going to do? I'm not a doctor. I don't have anything like any medications with me. What can I do? So as I said before, low glucose is life-threatening. High glucose, it is life-threatening, but it takes longer to get to that stage. So it gives you time to go to a hospital, okay? So let's say you are in a hospital and you're a doctor and someone is going into hypoglycemia. So what we think when we're in the hospital, we go, okay, we're going to give in 20 grams of glucose. And we have different medications or fluids that can mimic that amount. But you might be wondering, but how can I do it if I'm at uni, if I'm at home, if I'm in the street, if I'm in the, in the shop, in the, in the shopping center, if I'm in the, in the public transport, what can I do? So maybe, maybe you're lucky and you might have some Lucasade on your back because you thought, you know, I kind of like this drink. It can be useful. And this alone with 150 miles can give you 20 grams of glucose. But you might think, okay, uh, but I don't know if that's going to be enough. Maybe there will be something else. So the other option is, well, how about 200 mils of lemonade? And you can get a lemonade anywhere, especially for a near shop. You can go get the lemonade and give it to that person. Okay. Now, some orange juice, 200 mils of orange juice, 
that should do the trick. And this is this is something you probably didn't expect to see, but four jelly babies or gummy bears would do the trick as well. Would give you that amount of glucose necessary for that person to actually get gain their levels back to close to normal. But that will give you enough time to get help. Four, four teaspoons of sugar. We know that in the UK, drinking tea is a very common thing. So you, it's very easy to get some teaspoon of sugar anywhere, really. So you just need to scream for help and try to see if you can get some sugar for that person. And last but not least, you can use 20 Skittles. So if you ever seen Skittles, which are quite good if you like them, uh, you can use 20. Okay, or in some cases, some patients might actually have glucose tablets with them. So they might tell you, I have some glucose tablets in my backpack, please take it. So things like that are pretty straightforward to use. Now, it's very important to remember that if the patient's unconscious, you're not going to try to force food down their throat. At this point, you need to call 999 call for help, okay? Some, sometimes it's better to call for help than to try to all do all those things if you think the person is going to be unable to swallow. So if the person is still talking to you, but they're still a bit kind of, you know, dizzy, a bit lightheaded, a bit drowsy, but they can speak to you, that means that there is a chance that they will be able to drink or take any of these. But if they're not, there is a chance that if we try to force any of these down their throat, they might aspirate into their lungs or they might suffocate. So, or they might choke on it, which could be potentially very dangerous. So we need to make sure that we know if the person's okay to drink or not. So at this point, I want you to write down the questions that you might have about this topic. Okay, so the key points here is that there is a, balance between the insulin amount that's coming in and the glucose or sugar or food that you're taking in. If there is an imbalance between these two, let's say less food and more insulin, then the chances are you might go into hypo or low sugar, okay? And if, if that's the case, there are things that we can do once we identify that this person is going to low sugar. So like I said before, there's many drinks that you can take or many things that you can eat, but always be sure that that person can actually swallow. If they are too drowsy to swallow, then the chances are it's better to just call for help rather than trying to force anything down their throat. So I want you to take a moment. I want you to go into the, to the chat, write your questions about it, co comment on any, any, any scenarios you, you lived in the past, any issues you had in the past, any things you want to know specifically about this topic. So we move on to the next one. Now, this might be a bit intimidating, especially when you see the heart. Although we're kind of used to always looking at the heart shape, and, you know, a uh, heart shape rather than that with chambers and all this blood that's sort of coming in and coming out. But to understand in very simple terms what the heart does, it's a pump. It gets blood from a point A to a point B. So it takes all the venous blood, which is the, the oxygenated blood, and sends it to the lungs, brings it back, and send it, sends it back to the rest of the body with oxygen. In simple terms, that's what the heart does. Now, sometimes, as you can see, there is different chambers to the heart, which could be very useful to know. You have a top part of the heart and you have a lower part of the heart. Now, because the heart is, has tissue, and you can see this is all tissue, and this is muscle. So it's muscular tissue. Now this mus muscle, like anything in the body, is going to have a blood supply, which means someone needs to feed that muscle. And that something is the coronary arteries, which they come from the aorta, which is a big blood vessel, a big artery that comes out of the heart and supplies the entire body with good oxygenated blood. So these coronary arteries are basically the supply for the muscle in the heart. So let's put it this way. Let's say we, everyone in this session is 
a hot muscle and someone needs to come and give you some food and some drinks, okay? So some food and some drinks, whatever you like, that's your nutrients, that's your blood supply. But sometimes what can happen is that the blood supply might be affected or might be completely stopped. So this is a picture of a blood vessel. So these are the walls, so you can see, and this is the inside of the blood vessel or the artery. This here, you can see, it's what we call a fat plague. But basically, a fat plague comes from us having poor lifestyles, like not being active, not having healthy food, being very sedentary at home, things like that. Sometimes it could be just hereditary. That means that it just comes in the family. But the issue with the arteries or the food supply to the heart tissue is that if this gets compromised, that means that food is not going to reach its destiny. So, so you can see this is your coronary artery wall, and that's a cholesterol plague or fat plague. And this is a reduced blood flow, which is a reduced food supply for you. all of us are in the session. So if that food supply gets reduced, some of us are going to be a bit cranky because we might be hungry during the session. And we might want some food. So we might not be paying attention. We, now might, we might be feeling a bit dizzy as well. If some of us have diabetes and we're taking insulin, our glucose levels might be going low as well. So reduce blood flow, reduce food supply to the heart tissues. So remember that. Now, the reason why I show you this picture is because this alone is something that you might hear a lot. It's called angina. And some people might call it mini heart attacks. Or some people actually use the term angina. You might have a friend, you might have a relative, you might have someone that has angina. Angina basically means heart pain or chest pain that it's due to a reduced blood flow or food supply to the heart tissue. So it's just reduced. Remember, it's just reduced. So all this, this cardiac, cardiac muscle, the cardiac cells, are fine. They're getting some blood. They're not getting a whole lot, but they're getting some blood. But because they're not getting what they are meant to be getting, you get a bit of pain because they're struggling. So they do get something that it's called angina. But sometimes what happens is that all this plague could rupture. As you can see, there was a little rupture here. And then the platelets our friendly players are usually there to prevent us from bleeding out when we have a small injury. That's what clots the blood. They start sticking together and they form a big blood clot. In this case, as you can see, it's not reduced, but it is actually completely blocked. So in the first scenario, we're all together in the session. But what happened was, is that you, you were not giving enough food for everyone. Just some of you were getting food, some of you were getting very small plates, some of you were getting a big plate. But when you have blood clot, which is considered a heart attack, that it's when there is no food supply at all. That means it's cut off. So no one gets food, everyone's moody, everyone's hypoglycemic or very low sugar because of this, okay? So when that happens, that territory that the blood supply is meant to provide with all the nutrients of all the food is going to start dying and that's what we call a heart attack and this dying muscle it is an emergency because we need to try to see if we can get that muscle or what's left of it some food okay now there is some difference that you can think of when you want to identify the difference between anginas and heart attacks. So most of the times, the angina is going to happen during you're doing some bit of exercise, if you're stressed or the weather is very extreme, very cold, it's usually gonna happen very suddenly, but it's gonna go away in about 15 to 20 minutes. Whereas the heart attack, you might be just watching telly and you might get very sudden chest pain and it's not going anywhere. It's staying there more than 20 minutes, more than an hour, it's still there. And the pain can be in the chest. 
And that pain, usually, it's described by many people like dull, they are like a tightness or pressure in the face and in, in, in their in their chest. And sometimes, especially in people who are diabetic, remember our friends from the first topic, diabetic patients, uh, they might feel like it's just indigestion. So they might hear, hear, feel a bit of a heartburn. And they're like, oh, it's just a bit of heartburn I'm having. So always keep in mind, if you're diabetic and you're getting a bit of heartburn, it's not going, to, it's not going away, you might have a heart attack. So you always need to get some help for this. The location most of the time is pretty much the same. It's going to be in the chest and that the pain is going to move to your jaw, to your neck. And usually, and sometimes you might go to your left arm. It doesn't typically happen, but when it does, you're going to know it's going to the left arm pretty good. Like I said, me, said before, duration is usually longer than 30 minutes for a heart attack and angina are shorter. The skin... The same as before, patient is going to look pale. It might be very sweaty. And the difference between one and the other one is that they say the heart attack will, will sweat profusely compared to angina, but it really depends on the people um, and the person itself. So I wouldn't go take that too literal. Then the pulse, it might be very different. Um, sometimes you might be missing beats. And you can get some other signs and symptoms, like they might be short of breath, they might feel a bit dizziness. And this one's very specific, the impending doom. When someone tells you, I don't know, I feel something's wrong, I feel as if I'm going to die. The impending doom feeling, that's usually a trigger, this is dangerous, something's going on. And there's some things that could alleviate the symptoms like DTM, which is a medication. And most patients that are known to have heart problems, they might be on DTM spray, which is basically something that helps dilate those arteries to improve supply. But in general terms, for you to make a big difference between one and the other, it's usually the time. Angina is gonna be very short and it's usually gonna be triggered by some sort of exercise stress and extreme weather, whereas heart attacks are gonna be longer than 30 minutes and they can happen at rest. And then the rest of the things are gonna be very similar. So the things to keep in mind, if someone's having symptoms, chest pain, and it's been there for more than eight minutes, you should be calling 999. There's nothing for you to do in terms of first aid, more than just calling an ambulance and let them know there's something wrong with this person, we need some help, I think they might be having a heart attack. They might instruct you to do some things, but most of the times they try to reach there as soon as possible because time equals tissue viability, which means the longer we wait for that patient to have treatment, the longer, uh, the, the more the damage is going to be on the heart. So it's very important to know that time is very important here. So call 999 if you think someone's having a heart attack. So again, try to think about a scenario, something that happened to you, something that you think you might want to know about heart attacks. Remember chest pain, that sensation that something's wrong. I don't know what's wrong. Something's wrong with my heart, something's wrong with my chest. That pain going to the left arm, going to the jaw, going to the neck. Sometimes you might go to the back as well. Oh, if you're a patient with diabetes, remember those heartburn or the indigestion, try to keep an eye on that, especially if they last too long. Now we're gonna move on to something that's called a stroke or a brain attack. So if you keep the same analogy from the heart attack, it's pretty much the same thing. The only difference is this time, it's the brain is gonna be affected by the blood supply or the food supply. So usually what happens is that it can have a clot, the same as it happened in the heart, and it can cause a blockage, which can either completely block the supply or sometimes that artery might rupture. So it might cause a bleed inside the brain, or if it's just a blockage, it could just cause a reduced or complete occlusion of supply to that tissue in the brain. Now, there is some words that you need to think of if you think someone is having a heart attack. So fast, 
Well, so fast is a pretty good acronym that's going to be helpful for you to remember. The F stands for facial weakness. So all of a sudden, you're talking to someone and they're, they're talking to you, or they might not be talking to you. They might just do some gestures. They, may be, they might be smiling. And all of a sudden, one side of the face is just not moving properly. And they're smiling, and you can see that one side of the face is smiling, but the other one's not. You're like, oh, this is strange. Or they might, might, be, might be lifting one of their eyebrows up, but the other one's not. Or they might close their eyes, and one side of, of one of the eyes remains open. So that, it's like, that's weird. So facial weakness, think of F. There's something wrong here. So this is a good example. This is a facial palsy that you can see. And arm weakness. All of a sudden, they're sitting down and they can't move one of their arms. This is weird. Why? They can't do it. Or they're sitting down, they want to get up, but they can't seem to be able to do it. The other thing is speech problems, slur speech. So they're talking to you and they're telling you, let's say I'm telling you this, I'm giving you this session today and I'm talking about stroke and all of a sudden I start going, and you wonder what's happening to this person. So that's a slur speech, the speech problems. They can't speak, but sometimes they go, oh, they can't speak. So they become completely silent, but they, they seem to try to, but they can't. And those things should um, light that small uh, alert in your head. Okay, they're having facial weakness, having some weakness in the arms, and having some speech problems. So T, time to call 99. Same as the heart, it's very important to call as soon as we, as we think there might be a stroke happening or a brain attack to someone, and we need to call 999. You might think, but you know, this person only is having arm weakness. Should I still call 999? Of course, because it's better to have treatment or have a lot of investigations done at the hospital and find nothing rather than sit at home and just wait for the rest of the symptoms to show up. So I would think if something is concerning for me, I should call 999. So again, think about all the scenarios or those uh, past experience that you thought someone was having a brain a brain attack or a stroke and you didn't really know what to do. So, so far we know that if someone's having low glucose levels, what we're going to do, and we know that if they can't swallow, we can't give them anything, we still need to call 999 or get some help as soon as we can. And then for heart and for brain, we know that it's, in a, med it's a medical emergency that we can't really do much about it apart from giving a, a shout to the 999 and telling them, I think there's something wrong, please come and help. And they'll be happy to come and help you. So remember, think about scenarios, think about questions. You can write them in the chat if you want. And we'll address them at the end of the session. So now we're going to talk about asthma. Now asthma, uh, there's different types of asthma you might, you, might, you might have heard before, but we'll just focus on what asthma is. So asthma, is basically when your normal airway is dysfunctional. And what I mean by dysfunctional, this is your airway in the lungs. That means this, this all this tube you, hear, you see here are within your lungs. You have a bunch of them. But sometimes what happens is that they might get narrowed. And that narrowing, the same as it happened to the heart, the same as it, ha as it happened to the brain. Remember, oxygen and food are energy and this equals life. So if you can't get oxygen because this is so narrow, it's not going through, chances are that energy is not going to get there. So life might be a bit threatened. So think asthma. Your normal airway is not working properly. It's just becoming very narrow. Some people might know what triggers their asthma. Some people might not know that they're asthmatic. So what things need to come to mind when you think this person might be having an asthma attack or they might be asthmatic? One of the things I might tell you is that I'm having a very hard time to breathe. I just feel very breathless. That's one thing. Then one thing you might hear is a bit of wheeze, which is kind of like a whistling sound coming from their chest. So they're struggling to breathe. 
and they are doing this whistling sound, which is called the wheeze. And sometimes you might see them, they're kind of leaning forward, trying to catch their breath as well. They will have a hard time trying to speak. So this is something you need to keep in mind, they're having a hard time breathing, they're doing a whistling sound, and the whistle should trigger an alert in your, in your brain saying, okay, this is not right, There's something wrong here. And that's when you need to speak to them and you notice that they're not speaking properly. They're having a hard time, like they just ran a marathon and they're short of breath, they're trying to catch their breath, say a couple of words to even complete a sentence, they might go breathless. They, be, they can be very pale, very clammy. They might turn gray or even blue to a certain point, depending on the severity of the asthma attack. You might see that the muscles in the neck and the upper chest the start uh, contracting because they're trying to get that air in, but they just can't do it. And remember, because your normal airway is not working properly, there's narrowing. So what the, the, the rest of the body is trying to do is trying to push air through that resistance and that narrowing in the airways. And if there's a very severe attack, you're going to look at the person, they're going to look exhausted, completely drained, they're not going to be talking much, they're going to be very breathless, and like I said, they're going to have quite a few things that can lead to them being unconscious or stop breathing. Obviously, if someone stops breathing, we're going to talk about this in another session, what you're going to do about your basic life support, how you're going to do uh, if you're going to do chest compressions, how you're going to provide oxygen, etc. We're not going to cover that today, but keep in mind, you're going to need another session to complete that knowledge. So you know that this could lead to that. Now, there's something that it's, it's commonly said in asthma attacks. If there's a silence in asthma, it's never good and it can be deadly. Because remember, oxygen and food becomes in, it turns into energy, and this all together equals life. If we don't have oxygen, no energy, so life could be threatened. The same as the heart and the brain need the food supply or the blood supply to give that food, which basically is what we eat, it goes all the nutrients, all that energy goes to your cells, and they all become energy, and that equals life. So remember, silence in asthma is not good, it is deadly. So what can we do to help them? Because obviously, in these cases, what's going to happen is that you need to do something. If they're known to have asthma, most of the times they will have their inhalers with them. Okay? And most of the time, this inhaler is going to be blue, which is usually made of salbutamol. So that inhaler is of salbutamol, which is used for crisis. And that what salbutamol does is just dilates that narrowed, airway to let that air go through without any resistance so you need to ask them where is your inhaler so things to do if you have a spacer which they will tell you have a spacer with it they should be able to use it so do that if not just go for the inhaler and give them a couple puff which is just pressing the inhaler they know how to use it and hopefully that should do the trick until you get help okay Tell them to sit upright. Don't, don't tell them to lay down uh, and then take them out to very cold air because cold air is going to make that airway a bit more narrow because it's a bit reactive at that time. So keep them sit up straight, keep them inside your home, try to get that inhaled. And in the meantime, call, a, uh, call 999 to get some help. Okay, because in, in the meantime, they're trying to get there to help you, you can give them a bit of salbutamol, which could be really helpful for them and could prevent a life-threatening event, which could lead to this person ending in ICU or something worse, like dying because of this. So it's very important to know. Don't freak out. Don't go crazy and just say, okay, the airway is compromised. Let's try to get the airway open. The only thing I know I can use is salbutamol. Do I have salbutamol? I don't have salbutamol. So if you don't have salbutamol, call 999 straight away. Don't think more about anything else. Get help 
on the way and then keep them sit up right try to tell them to breathe slowly maybe that will help but just try to keep them calm as much as you can if they have their inhaler with them then they can use it but always call help because you might need more than just your salbutamol inhaler to treat this attack if they don't have their inhaler it's and someone in the group or maybe you have an inhaler at home or for some reason you have a salbutamol inhaler before you you offer that inhaler to that person ask them are you allergic to anything are you allergic to have you used salbutamol before have you used this inhaler before because some people might be allergic and we don't know so it's better to ask before they go into uh, an aphylaxis, which is another topic you'll be uh, revising uh, in another session with my colleagues. So you need to always stay, stick for that. Um, but like I said, always keep in mind that if they're not used to salbutamol, they might be allergic to it. So always ask. It's very important to ask. So again, think about the, those scenarios that might come to mind, this past experience that could be potentially um related to these topics and just to go through take home points which are very important to know is that if you have someone with low glucose levels or low sugar levels it's far more dangerous than having high remember high blue high glucose level or sugar levels gives you time to go to the hospital low sugar levels on the other hand are a very very uh, dangerous situations that we need to address as soon as we can if the patient or the person is, is unconscious at the console, don't force anything down their throat, still call 999, get some help. In the meantime, try to keep them uh, sit up in a right position if you can, or in some cases, depending, especially if there, there's a risk of them vomiting, you can put them on their side. But other than that, and those are all the, those are the maneuvers you will learn in another session, so I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna go into that for now. But, that being said, remember, if you can, you can give all those options we had, from Skittles to gummy bears to, uh, to some orange juice, some, to some lemonade, some sugar. There's quite a few things you can do. And if you do that, they might get back, you know, they might feel a bit better, but it's always good to check the glucose if they have a monitor at home, or if they don't, please take call 999 still to get some help. Then the other two, remember, brain and heart they got food supply they got arteries if they get blocked we, we will be in trouble because that tissue or that cells are going to be struggling to breathe struggling to get nutrients to get food which could uh, potentially uh, end in catastrophe which means they will die the cells will die and that will cause either a heart attack or a stroke or a brain attack what we should do, we need to call 999, get some help, get, get some help uh, as soon as we can so we can get this person, this patient, this friend, or this relative, or this stranger in the street, doesn't matter. We can get them to a hospital, get them some treatment. Hopefully that time, that good window of time for them to get appropriate treatment will decrease the chances of that damage to be permanent or be very massive, okay? And last but not least, Asthma attack, remember, a normal airway is just not working properly, so it's very narrow. So what we need to do is if we have salbutamol, we can give them salbutamol because the usual, if they're non-asthmatic, they will have their salbutamol inhaler with them. They always carry around, it's usually blue, and you always ask them, can you take this? If they say yes, go for it, they can take it. If they've never taken salbutamol, ask them, have you ever taken salbutamol before? If they say no, are you allergic to anything? And they say no, hopefully it should be fine. Not many people are allergic to salbutamol, but it's, 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 never, uh, it's never bad to ask and just be extra safe. So if you have any other questions, obviously you can contact me on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. I'm happy to help. I'm always happy to um, uh, answer any questions. And now we're going to go to the chat and see what we can find. So I'm going to stop my sharing now. And there we go. So. So I have a question from Usama Amar. And she's asking us, what is the significant symptoms of a hypoglycemia that I can, that I can know that this is hypoglycemic crisis? So basically, like I said before, all these three from exception 
uh, to asthma because they're going to be very short of breath. Um, they're all going to go pale. They might all go clammy. So what's going to be very helpful for you to differentiate between uh, it being hypoglycemia or low sugar and high uh, sugar is that high sugar is not going to be, the patient's not going to be clammy, it's not going to be pale. They're going to be uh, talking to you. They might have a bit of a tummy ache, they might be vomiting, but they're not going to be drowsy. They're not going to be pale. They're not going to be clammy. Uh, they're, going, they're not going to be having a bit of slur speech. They're going to be speaking to you. So that's a big difference because remember, low sugar, because the brain needs sugar. So the low, low sugar, what's going to do basically is that that brain cells are going to be like, you know what? We're not getting enough blood supply or food supply because for some reason, the levels are low and you know the brain cells we the brain cells we need food supply so because your brain controls everything everything's just going to start shutting down because the brain is not getting their food and that in simple terms is how you identify a low sugar remember they're going to go pale they're going to go clammy but they might become confused, they might be lightheaded, or they might become drowsy, or they might become, uh, they might have a bit of slow speech. So all that together, and you know they are, they're probably diabetic, then you go, you know what, I think this might be a low sugar. But let's say you don't know the person, you just see them in the street, it wouldn't hurt to give them something for low glucose or low sugar, even if you don't know that this patient is diabetic. It might be something else. It might be something else they're having, but let's say they're having a heart attack and they think it's a bit of indigestion and you give them a bit of, um, give them some gummy bears. It's not gonna make much difference to the heart. If they're having a brain attack or stroke, the same thing is gonna happen. You give them a bit of sugar, it's not gonna make much difference. And the same thing is gonna happen with asthma. By asthma, they're gonna be very short breath, they're gonna be to a certain point, hyperventilating, breathing really fast, or trying to breathe really fast, trying to get air to the lungs. And any other condition out there, if they're having it, giving them a bit of, of lemonade or orange juice is not going to do any harm. So in, if in doubt, give them a little bit of orange juice and it should be fine. Um, let's see. Dr. Solano. Yes. We would like to say a huge thank you for that very informative session. We have received a couple of questions outside of the Zoom. Uh, I don't think there's any other questions uh, in the chat right now. But people who are with us, if you do have any questions, please do take a moment and type them in the chat for us. So, uh, Dr. Solano, one question was, how do I know, once again, uh, that what I'm going through is actually angina or that I need to call 999 immediately because I am having a heart attack or a stroke? Most of the times what happens with angina, like I said, it's it reduced blood supply, which means that anything that can make your heart go faster that requires more food supply, like let's say you go for a run, let's say you're stressed, let's say you're mad, let's say it's very cold and your heart is trying to pump more blood around to keep you warm, or you go down the stairs. So things like that, that shouldn't give you chest pain, might give you chest pain. So that's going to that's gonna feel more like an angina rather than a heart attack. Whereas the heart attack, it's a complete block. So you're going to feel it just coming straight on. Like you're just watching the telly and all of a sudden the pain is going to come to your chest. Now, the duration is very different one from the other. Angina is very short durations. A heart attack is longer. So after 20 minutes, you still feel that pain. You might, you might start to wonder, is this a heart attack? After 30 minutes, you're sitting in the couch. Maybe let's say you went up the stairs and you got the pain and then you sat down, but the pain didn't go away. You wait a little longer, it's 30 minutes, it hasn't gone away. That could be a heart attack. So you need to call 999. But if you went up the stairs and you get the heart, the, the, the chest pain, and you sit down and the pain starts to ease down, that's probably angina. Regardless of the case, one needs to prompt you to call 999 and go straight to the hospital. The other one needs to prompt you to, to speak to your GP to get this investigated further to get some treatment for. So that will be the two main difference. 
Fantastic. Thank you for that, Dr. Solano. We have a question that has just come in on the chat asking you, can someone get asthma in the age of 20 or even more? Or is this something that would have happened with them only as a child? So I think it's a double barreled question there. So, so we used to think that, 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 that people would just develop asthma when they were younger. And that's what we always grew up believing. However, there is certain types of asthma that you can have later in life, like late onset asthma. Uh, let's say you're 35 and for some reason you might develop asthma. But most of the times it could be related to other conditions like autoimmune conditions and things like that. It's very rare, it can happen, but it's not very common. Most of the times, most people will have asthma as a kid and they will turn 10 or 11 and they will no longer have asthma. Some people will, will go into to the teens and they might be 19, 20, and then all of a sudden they just no more asthma. Some people might be 30, 40, and they had asthma since they were kids and then the asthma never went away. They might be 90 and they might still be asthmatic. So it's very different, but most of the times it happens when they're young and it usually goes away at some point in their life with very rare cases that they carry on throughout their life. And you might have a small portion that might come when you're older, but it's very, very small and very rare. Thank you very much. I think that was a very helpful and insightful um, point there. I think another question just on the topic of asthma was um, living in the UK, the weather does uh, get very cold. And so what's the best way to kind of take care of a child who gets seasonal asthma? And is that actually a real thing? It is. Well, it's called seasonal asthma because basically what happens is that the change in weather it kind of triggers that narrowing changes in the airway so that's why it's considered a seasonal asthma per se um, but what what you can really do and this is this is just a general advice really because obviously we can't really change the weather outside as long as we can change the weather where the where the children is going to spend most of the time okay so most of the times what they do is that uh, in, in home or indoors to try to keep the temperature uh, uh, adequate that doesn't really trigger the asthma. And then what your, your physician or GP or whoever's looking after the kid, what they might do is that they might prescribe some inhalers to be used during that time to try to prevent those, um, those, those, those episodes basically. And they might just be on them throughout that season. And then at the end of the season, when they know their, their episodes decrease in frequency, they might just stop. So two, th two ways to do it is one at home, try to keep a good temperature, try to keep uh, the surface clean of dust because dust can sometimes trigger asthma as well. Or if you have pets or if you have a lot of like uh, fluffy animals and stuff like that, uh, or dull stuff like, like they accumulate a lot of dust that could trigger asthma as well. But if it's just related to the weather, try to keep a good uh, temperature inside your home. And when you go out, you can try to use all those layers and that might be helpful. But remember, the air is always going to go through the nose it kind of gets warm up a little bit in the nose regardless. But if it's very cold outside, even our own nasal mechanism is not going to warm enough to get to the lungs. So you might get a bit of irritations. So usually speaking to a GP to try to get, let's say some haze for that period of time could be helpful. But obviously there's more investigations to it than just asking for inhalers. Fantastic. Thank you ever so much. We have just one final question that's come through, uh, which is just asking about first aid. And the person is asking, um, how important is it for me to take first aid training, even though I have no medical background whatsoever? So this is actually a very good question, because most, most countries, um, uh, they won't really have this culture of trying to teach people first aid. And I tell you why it's very important to know, because you just never know where you're going to be standing tomorrow and you never know who's going to walking through the door walking through the through the tram uh, doors or the bus doors and what's going to happen and some things that can be managed as a first aid assistant a first aid uh, responder could potentially save someone's life to the point that you might have someone that collapsed in the middle of the street and because you know your, your, your basic life support, you've done some training on, on first aid, 
you go and check and you see that this this person is not responding and there is no pulse and you freak out when you think i need to give this person chest compressions and you do and those chest compressions can actually save that person's life or if they have low glucose and you see someone in the street and they tell you oh, i'm diabetic as, as they're you know kind of fading away and then you're like oh my god I have some juice in my back and I could just take it out of my backpack, give it to the person, give her, and they kind of come back to life slowly. That could potentially save that person's life. So the question is, why, um, why have first aids? It's the question should be why not everyone uh, it's having trained for first aid. So this is actually very good to have the sessions where you can actually learn the basics about things that are commonly happen everywhere we go, every day. You never know who's going to be next to you. You're just going to go pale climbing. You go, uh-oh, I need to do something to help this person. And you might be the difference between that person making it to hospital alive and just unfortunately dying there. So I think I would encourage everyone, because there's a lot of sessions coming up, very good sessions. Uh, we're going to address a lot of topics uh, regarding first aid, things that you can do as a non-medical uh, professional at your workplace, at your home, in the street, in the bus, in the tram, as you're walking past uh, a shopping mall, anything. You could be a difference between someone getting back to their loved ones and just not getting back to them. So I would say go for first aid sessions always. Perfect. Thank you ever so much, Dr. Solano. We really appreciate this, and I hope that everyone joining us today has found this session beneficial and useful. Uh, lots of very helpful tips there, and I just want to remind everyone the session is recorded and will be provided later on uh, on the Egyptians Together Union channel on YouTube, the links for which are provided on our Facebook pages and all of our social media platforms. Just a reminder, once again, this is the first session of a sequence of five sessions. The next session is tomorrow, Sunday, the 17th of October at 6.30 p.m. UK time. Do try to join us, please, for all of the sessions. This is the first aid online training course provided for you by the Egyptians Together Union. And if you are a member, you will be able to receive a certificate uh, after you've attended all five sessions, of course. To be a member, once again, the membership is free until the 31st of December. More information is provided on the website, www.egyptianstogether.com. If you click onto the website and there is a button for becoming a member, please do join. If you feel like you've missed any of the information provided today or you do have any further questions or when you join us uh, in future sessions, there might be an opportunity to touch upon some more of these topics. Uh, Dr. Solano, was there any uh, last words you'd like to share with the attendees, please? Dr. Solano, your microphone is muted. Oh, sorry, yes, here you go. So just encourage everyone to join the other sessions. You're gonna find a lot of knowledge that can be really useful, very easy to, to, to digest and easy to follow. Um, you, will, you will learn a lot of things that might be scary, a lot of things that might be a bit challenging, but if you, if you want to help someone, I think the best thing you can do is try to get the basics in your brain. And trust me, if you ever you come along any of these situations, you will do good and you will uh, succeed in terms of helping that person, even just holding someone's hand. Trust me, you will help. So that's very good. And um, I appreciate the invite. And hopefully we'll see you around in some of the sessions at some time in the future. So thank you, everyone. and Have a good, good night, evening. Thank you ever so much. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thank you, Dr. Solano. We look forward to seeing you in future sessions. And um, take care. Stay safe, stay positive, and test negative.